Hello, friends. Welcome to 3ABN Worship Hour. I'm Pastor James Rafferty, and this Worship Hour, we're going to be getting a new study on Daniel chapter 11. The title of our first study is Rage Against the Covenant. Daniel chapter 11 has been a challenging chapter for all of us, but we need to understand the words that are written in this book because we've been admonished by Jesus Christ that whoever reads the book of Daniel is to understand the book of Daniel. And that those words are given to us in Matthew chapter 24. Rage Against the Covenant, Daniel chapter 11, part one. Our scripture reading is found in Hebrews chapter 10. If you'd like to open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10, verses 16 and 17. So we'll read these verses, we'll have a word of prayer, and then we'll jump right in to our study. Hebrews Chapter 10, verses 16 and 17. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds will I write them and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Let's pray together as we begin our study. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation and, and the other prophecies of the Bible. Thank you that we have been given the promise that when we pray for the gift of the Holy Spirit to guide us and teach us, to show us things to come, that you will answer that prayer because we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. And we claim the promise in Matthew chapter 7, ask and it shall be given you, seek and you will find, knock and the door shall be opened unto you. We claim that promise because we're studying a chapter of Bible prophecy that is difficult, that's challenging, and we need the Holy Spirit to be our guide, our teacher, and the revealer of these truths. So do that for us now, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Daniel chapter 11 is a challenging chapter, but it is a beautiful chapter of scripture. There's so much in here for us to understand about our relationship with God. And that's why the title Rage Against the Covenant. There is a power in Daniel chapter 11 that is not happy about the covenant. In verse 28, it says his heart is against the holy covenant. In verse 30 of Daniel 11, it says he has indignation against the holy covenant. And again, in that same verse, he forsakes the holy covenant. And then again, in verse 32 of Daniel 11, it says, he does wickedly against the covenant. So his heart is against the covenant. He has indignation against the covenant. He forsakes the holy covenant and he does wickedly against the covenant. So we can see from these verses that there is a rage against the covenant. Now, as we take in these prophetic Bible verses in Daniel chapter 11, it is clear to see that this rage against the Holy Covenant is an end time prophetic scenario because we're in Daniel chapter 11, the latter part of the chapter. And so it's really important for us to understand these verses. So what is the key to unlocking Daniel chapter 11, specifically verses 28 all the way through the rest of the chapter to verse 45. And I would like to suggest that even chapter 12 of Daniel, verses one through three, belong to Daniel chapter 11. It's not until you get to chapter 12 and verse four that the vision of Daniel 11 actually ends. So we're gonna include those three verses as we continue on through this study in later parts. But what is the key to unlocking this? Well. One key to understanding or unlocking this is understanding what the Holy Covenant is. If we can understand what the Holy Covenant is, then we have a key to unlocking the mysteries, the symbolism, the prophecies of Daniel chapter 11. Another key is the principle, the biblical principle, the prophetic principle known as repeat and enlarge. And that's going to be a principle that's going to guide us as we study Daniel chapter 11. In fact, let's start with that principle. We're going to open up to Daniel chapter 11 and verse 1. That's a good place to start. Daniel 11 and verse 1. If you'd like to look at verse 1 there, Daniel is speaking about the vision that takes place in the first year of Darius the Mede. It says, in the first year of Darius the Mede, even I stood up to confirm and to strengthen him. And then it goes on to say in verse 2, and now I will show thee the truth. And of course, this is a messenger talking to Daniel in the book of Daniel 11, verse 2. And now I will show you the truth. Behold, there shall stand, stand up yet three kings in Persia, and the fourth shall be far richer than they all. So right here we have the beginning of the vision. The vision begins in the days of Medo-Persia. The, be, the, the vision begins 
in Daniel chapter 11, verses 1 and 2, under the kingdom of Medo-Persia. So we have the kingdom of Medo-Persia that is, uh, was a kingdom followed by the kingdom or following the kingdom of Babylon. Babylon begins in Daniel chapter uh, 2, and then Medo-Persia follows. In Daniel chapter 7, Babylon begins and Medo-Persia follows. In Daniel chapter 8, Babylon isn't mentioned because ba Babylon is, is uh, fading from the scene here, historical scene, but Medo-Persia is the first kingdom announced in Daniel 8. And in Daniel chapter uh, 11, Medo-Persia is the first kingdom. I mean, we see this principle of repeating the large here, Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 8, Daniel 11, all beginning in the time of Babylon or Medo-Persia and all taking us through, down through history to the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's the principle of repeat and enlarge. And we're going to build on this principle just a little bit. We go back to Daniel chapter 2, verse 39. We see in the image that was shown to Daniel there, to Nebuchadnezzar actually and interpreted by Daniel, we see that the Medo-Persian kingdom followed the head of gold. Medo-Persia, Daniel 2.39, was the kingdom that followed Babylon. When we go to Daniel 7, we see Medo-Persia was the kingdom that followed the lion with eagle's wings. Medo-Persia in Daniel 7, verse 5. And then when we go to Daniel 8, we see that Medo-Persia was the ram having two horns. They are identified there as the king of Media Persia. And so we see this outline, this biblical principle of repeat and enlarge. Different symbols are used. In Daniel 2, there's a statue. In Daniel 8, there's these different types of beasts. Or in Daniel 7, there's these different types of beasts. In Daniel 8, of course, there's a, a ram so far. We're going to see another uh, animal symbolizing a kingdom there as we go on. And so you have this repeat and enlarge principle that will help to guide us to understand exactly what the history is that is being outlined in these prophecies. So now let's go to Daniel 11 and verse 2. And by his strength and through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Grisha. So now we see Greece coming on the scene of action. If we go back to our chart again, we add to Medo-Persia the kingdom of Greece because Greece was the kingdom that followed Medo-Persia. We see this, for example, in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 39. Daniel 2 verse 39, in the image, Greece was likened unto the, the thighs of brass. In Daniel chapter 7 and verse 6, in the animals, the kingdom of Greece was likened unto a leopard with four heads and four wings. And in Daniel chapter 8 and verse 21, we see the male goat is the kingdom of Greece and the large horn that is between his eyes is the first king. So here we have a very powerful, very clear, very simple outline of the principle of repeat and enlarge. Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 8, Daniel 11. Each one of those is repeating and enlarging upon the previous vision. Yes, using different symbols, but each one is identifying, first of all, Babylon in Daniel 2, then Medo-Persia, then Greece. Daniel 7, Babylon, Medo-Persia, and then Greece. Daniel 8, Medo-Persia, and then Greece. Daniel 11, following the same basic outline of repeat and enlarge, Medo-Persia, and then and Greece. Now let's go to Daniel 11 and verse 3. And a mighty king shall stand up that shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. This is talking about, of course, the power of Greece that is following Medo-Persia. The mighty king would be Alexander the Great. He was the mighty king that stood up and did according to his will, conquered the entire world in a very short time. And then it goes on in verse 4 of Daniel 11. And when he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken and shall be divided to the four winds of the heavens. And what we see here is that Alexander the Great died at a very early age, in his early 30s. And when he died, after he died, his generals took over. His kingdom finally was divided among four prominent generals, Ptolemy, Seleucus, Cassander, and Lysicomus. So you have these four generals taking over Alexander's kingdom. And then finally, those four generals, uh, those kingdoms were divided up into two basic empires, the king of the north, the Seleucid dynasty, and the king of the south, Ptolemaic dynasty. So those two empires are, what are, being, are going to be talked about here as we continue on in Daniel chapter 11, the king of the north and the king of the south. And so we have this 
this clear understanding that parallels, I mean, that, that fits into history. History tells us there was Babylon, there was Medo-Persia, there was Greece, there was Rome. History tells us that when the Grecian kingdom took over the world, that, that Alexander, the first king, the first emperor, died at an early age and that eventually his kingdom was divided up into four generals and then eventually it fell into two empires, the king of the north, the king of the south, uh, the, top, uh, the, the two empires that we see outlined here in Daniel chapter. 11. Now let's look in Daniel chapter 11 and verse 14. Daniel 11 and verse 14 says, In those times there shall many stand up against the king of the south. Also the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision, but they shall fall. So who are the robbers of thy people? Well, God here, the angel here is talking to Daniel. So his people would be the Jewish people, the Jewish nation, the robbers of thy people, that word robbers is an interesting word. In the uh, Hebrew, it means a violent one, a breaker. It also means to break. And we find here in this Greek, this is the, these are the Strong's definitions. We find here in this Greek a connection between Daniel 11 and verse 14 and Daniel chapter 7 and verse 7. I want you to notice what it says in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 7. After this I saw in the night visions and behold a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth and it devoured and break in pieces. So this word break is, means the same as the word robbers in Daniel chapter 11. There is a connection taking place between a power that's being coming into action in, in Daniel chapter 11 and verse 14, and this fourth kingdom that came upon the scene in Daniel chapter 7. Now we know that this fourth kingdom is Rome. We know that because even though it's not identified, like the previous kingdoms were literally identified by name, even though it's not identified, we know that Babylon was followed by Medo-Persia, Medo-Persia was followed by Greece, and Greece was followed by Rome, the iron legs of Rome in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 40. And in Daniel chapter 7 and verse 7, we see the fourth beast that is terrible and has ten horns and three of the horns are plucked up. This is the kingdom of Rome. So both of these images are depicting the succession of empires leading to the Roman Empire. This is what we have so far in summary. We have Daniel 11 beginning with Medo-Persia in verses 1 and 2. Then followed by Greece in verses 3 through 13. Then followed by pagan Rome in verses 14 and we're going to go all the way to verse 29 with pagan Rome. Now, there's going to be a transition that we're going to look at in verses 28 and 29. We haven't gotten there yet. But by and large, we're looking at pagan Rome filling in the history of verses 14 to 28 or 29. How so? Well, let's just jump into the middle of Daniel chapter 11, right in the center of Daniel chapter 11. And we're going to find something really powerful as we look in the center of Daniel 11. Verse 20, Daniel 11, verse 20. Then shall stand up in his estate a raiser of taxes in the glory of the kingdom. But within few days he shall be destroyed, neither in anger nor in battle. So this is where Daniel 11 centers. And it's really significant, as we're going to see in a couple of verses, because this centering of Daniel 11 is actually going to hone in on an event that has changed our world. And that event is the birth of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. The Messiah, the Christ, is being honed in on here. Why? Because in the context of this fourth kingdom, the kingdom of pagan Rome, we have someone who has risen up in that kingdom who is a raiser of the taxes. Now the Bible is borrowing a little bit of history here and there, a little bit of terminology from history here and there, and putting it together for us so that we can hone in on what's most important in Bible prophecy. And you know what the most important thing in Bible prophecy is? Jesus. Jesus Christ, not the Antichrist. Jesus Christ is the most important thing in Bible prophecy. In fact, it's only as we understand Jesus Christ that we can even recognize the Antichrist. The only way we can understand the counterfeit is to know the genuine. We need to know Jesus as our Lord and Savior if we're going to be able to resist the counterfeit. And we'll see that as we continue on. So in Daniel 11 verse 20, we have a raiser of taxes. Now let's go to the New Testament. There's a verse in the New Testament in Luke chapter 2 and verse 1 that describes what happened when Christ was born. It came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus 
that all the world should be taxed. Now, this is powerful because this tax, this census brought Joseph and Mary to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, Mary was great with child. That child was Jesus Christ. So now what we're doing is we're connecting Daniel 11 and verse 20 to Luke chapter 2 and verse 1 and the birth of Jesus Christ. In verse 22, we're going to be able to make a connection to the death of Jesus Christ. So Daniel 11, 20, 21, and 22 pinpoints the birth and the death of Jesus. We'll see that in just a minute. One of the things we want to note, though, historically, is that Augustus was the first Roman emperor. He ruled from about 63 BC to about 14 AD. He began ruling and subjecting the whole world to him. Excuse me, he lived from 63 BC to about 14 AD, but he began ruling and subjecting the whole world to him in about 27 BC. And uh, he was a very liked ruler of the Roman people. And so this was the ruler. Augustus Caesar was the ruler when Jesus was born in Bethlehem. And again, because he sent out a census that all the world should be censored and taxed, uh, that the, their names should be written down so they could get, be taxed, Mary and Joseph had to go to Bethlehem. And guess what? That was prophesied as the city where Jesus would be born. All right, then it goes on in Daniel eleven twenty one to continue to give us a brief history of the pagan Roman power in the time of Christ. Remember, we've seen Augustus Caesar raise up in verse 20. Now we're looking at verse 21. What happens next? In his estate, that is in the estate of pagan Roman Empire, shall stand up a vile person to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. Now this is talking specifically of Tiberius Caesar. He, um, through marriage, was related to Augustus Caesar. He wasn't Augustus's first choice. He ruled from 14 AD to 37 AD, 14 AD to 37 AD. And uh, he get, began ruling in, actually in 13 AD with Tiberius. He was a co, uh, with Augustus. Tiberius was a co-precept or a co-ruler with Augustus for one year because Augustus' health was failing fast. And then on his passing in 14 AD, he took up uh, rulership without any upheaval. And so Tiberius was not as accepted as Augustus had been, but he was the only man available. There's a lot of history there. We won't go into all the history, but it's under Tiberius Caesar that Jesus Christ ends up being crucified. And we're going to see this in verse 22 of Daniel chapter 11. Verse 22 says, and with the arms of a flood shall they be overflown from before him, that is before Tiberius, and shall be broken... Remember the breaking of God's people that we talked about in an earlier verse. Yea, also the prince of the covenant. Now this is powerful because this is talking about Jesus Christ as the prince of the covenant. This is talking about Jesus Christ being broken. And this can be talking about none, none other thing but Calvary, the cross, where Jesus Christ was broken, where Jesus Christ was cut off, where Jesus Christ tasted death for every man, Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9. John chapter 19 and verse 12, uh, Jesus Christ here is on trial and it says that from henceforth Pilate sought to release him but the Jews cried out saying if thou let this man go thou art not Caesar's friend whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar and then it goes on to say they cried out away with him away with him crucify him and Pilate said shall I crucify your king and the chief priests answered, priests answered we have no king but Caesar. Now we want to understand what's going on here. It's really significant. In other words, this is definitely the pagan Roman Empire. Caesar is in control. First Augustus when Jesus is born. And now Tiberius as, Caesar, as Jesus is being brought to trial to be crucified. The Jewish leaders are disowning Christ and they're doing it by claiming that, ki that Caesar is their king. So you see what's taking place here. We have a shift in political alliance. The Jewish leaders are rejecting the Messiah, Christ, the King of Heaven, and they're taking or accepting an earthly king, specifically the earthly king of pagan Rome. 
Caesar. And we're going to see the same thing take place when we get to the end of Daniel 11 and specifically compare that with Revelation chapter 13. The whole world is going to repeat this. They're going to reject Jesus Christ and they're going to accept a Roman power in Christ's place and seek to worship this Roman power instead of worshiping Jesus Christ. We're going to get into those details a little bit later. But this is also a fulfillment of Daniel chapter 9. In Daniel chapter 9 in verse 27, Talking about Christ, it says, He shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. Now you notice again the covenant language here. It's very important for us to recognize Jesus came to confirm the covenant. He is the prince of the covenant. This is the everlasting covenant, the covenant that God and Christ made to redeem man if we were to fall. The covenant made from the foundation of the world. Hey, uh, Revelation chapter 13, verse 9, Christ, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. The covenant that fulfills Genesis 3, 15, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between her seed and thy seed. Ye shall bruise his heel, but he shall bruise your head. God speaking to Satan about our rescue from sin and its consequences. Jesus Christ has come to fulfill this covenant. Then there is a power, an earthly power, that's really being supported by Satan, by the devil, by the apostate, by the accuser, who is seeking to fight against this covenant and the fulfillment of this covenant in our experience, in our lives. And we're going to get into that as we continue on. So here's a brief outline of the prophecy in Daniel chapter 11, excuse me, Daniel chapter 9. That, that helps to buttress or, or support Daniel 11. First of all, we have the 70 week prophecy that was going from the decree to restore Israel in four, or yeah, is Jerusalem in 457 BC and moving down through time to Messiah the Prince and the time when the 70 weeks would end and the gospel would go to all the world. The first seven years of this prophecy, the 49 years, apply to the rebuilding of the temple and the city and the wall. Then you add 62 years to that seven, uh, uh, excuse me, 434 years to that 49 years or 62 weeks to the seven weeks, prophetic weeks, and it takes us down to Messiah the Prince. AD 27 and then of course you have one week left and after AD 27 Jesus Christ begins his ministry he's baptized in AD 27 begins his ministry for that last week in the middle of that week he's cut off in the middle of that week he dies for our sins and then at the end of that time Stephen is stoned the prophetic period ends, the 70 week period ends, 70 prophetic weeks, 490 literal years ends, and the gospel goes to the Gentiles through the early Christian church. So that's what we're looking at in Daniel chapter 9. Now, let's get back to our repeat and enlarged scenario, right? We've got Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 8, Daniel 11. We've got Babylon, Medo Persia, Greece, pagan Rome. Babylon, Medo Persia, Greece, pagan Rome. Medo Persia, Greece, pagan Rome. Medo Persia, Greece, pagan Rome. That's where we are in this principle of repeat and enlarge. If we follow the principle, we'll be able to understand the rest of the chapter. We've got to let the principle work itself out and then we'll be able to understand the rest of the chapter. So let's continue. Daniel chapter 11, verse 28. Then he shall return into his land with great riches and his heart shall be against the holy covenant. And then it goes on in verse 29, and at the time appointed, he shall return and come toward the south, but it shall not be as the former or as the latter. Now we want to break this down just a little bit because this is really important. It shall not be as the former or as the latter. Let's just look at an outline of this so that you can get this in your brain because this verse is a key verse for us. Verse uh, 29 of Daniel chapter 11. It's actually identifying the Roman power in three phases because it says it's not going to be as the former, that would be pagan Rome, or as the latter, that's going to be the papal Roman power that comes out of pagan Rome, that sits in the place of pagan Rome, but after its wound, a deadly wound that is inflicted on this power is healed. So the third phase, which is the one that we're about to read about in Daniel 11 verses 29 and onward, is the rise of the papal power, right? The rise of the papal power. It's not going to be as the former, pagan Rome, or as the latter, 
papal Rome healed, but it is this stage, the stage that's being described in these verses. This power is returning to make a war against the Holy Covenant. And this power is coming against the covenant, not as it came before, pagan Rome, and not, not as it's going to come in the end of time, papal Rome with the wound healed, working with the, the earth power in Revelation chapter uh, 13. Now, I know we're jumping ahead a little bit, trying to pull all these pieces together, but you got to remember, this is a challenging prophetic chapter. And what we want to do is put on the edges and the corners, like putting together a jigsaw puzzle, put the edges on, put the corners in, then we'll fill in a lot of the details. And I think after we fill in a lot of those details, that it's all going to come together and we're going to see the picture that this prophetic puzzle is bringing out here. So let's look again at verse 29. At the time appointed, he shall return and come toward the south, but it shall not be as the former pagan Rome or as the latter papal Rome healed. So we're looking at Rome in three phases. We're looking at the former being pagan Rome. We're looking at the latter being papal Rome. And then we have deadly wound healed. Or we could say that we're looking at papal Rome in two phases. Papal Rome in two phases. Now think about this. When we're looking at papal Rome in two phases, we're simply looking at papal Rome in its first phase and then and prior to the deadly wound. And then we're going to see papal Rome in its final phase. So right now, we're looking at the rise of papal Rome in its very first stage upon planet Earth. All right, let's look in Daniel chapter 11 and verse 28. Daniel chapter 11 and verse 28. Then shall he return into his land with great riches, and his heart shall be against the holy covenant. Verse 30. Therefore he shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the holy covenant, so shall he do. Verse 30. He shall even return and have intelligence with them who forsake the holy covenant. Notice, two emphasis on the Holy Covenant in verse 30 of Daniel 11. And now we're going to look at verse 32, the, the final one. And such as do wickedly against the covenant, he shall corrupt by flatteries. Now, I want you to notice this. This is really significant, right? The covenant is central. And of course, Jesus Christ is the prince of the covenant. Notice here that his heart is against the Holy Covenant in verse 28, that he has indignation against the Holy Covenant in verse 29, or 30, that he forsakes the Holy Covenant in verse 30, and that he is with those who do wickedly against the Holy Covenant in verse 32. So we need to with all of this antagonism in Daniel 11 against the Holy Covenant, it is vital for us to discover what God's Holy Covenant is. Daniel 11 is all about the Holy Covenant. In fact, the entire book of Daniel is all about the Holy Covenant. The entire book has a theme of Holy Covenant that runs through it. And this is what we're going to discover as we continue on here. Let's just take a look at what the Holy Covenant is from the Bible. Now, I can tell you what I think the Holy Covenant is. You probably could tell me what you think the Holy Covenant is. But why don't we let the Bible tell us what the Holy Covenant is? Daniel is all about this theme of the Holy Covenant. The Bible has to explain what the Holy Covenant is so that we can get a right understanding, be on the right track for our interpretation of this prophecy. So in order to do that, we want to go to the New Testament. The New Testament book of Hebrews, chapter 8 and beginning with verse 10, and we'll outline there exactly what the Holy Covenant is. Notice what it says. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind uh, and I will write them in their hearts. I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest." For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities. I will remember no more. These verses are power packed. There is so much in here that it would be good for us to do a brief outline of what the Bible is telling us about the Holy Covenant. So let's look at a brief outline of this. First of all, it's talking about God's power. Then it's talking about God's law. Then it's talking about God relationship. Then it's talking about God anointing. And it's also talking about God's forgiveness, God's power, God's law, God relationship, God anointing, God's forgiveness. All of that is in these verses. And this is what the new covenant is all about. God's law, God's power, God relationship, God anointing, God forgiveness. And it's all promised to the house of Israel. So we need to ask the question, who is the house of Israel? 
Here's what the Bible tells us in the New Testament about who the house of Israel are. Who is the house of Israel? That's our big question. Who is the house of Israel? In Romans chapter 2, verses 28 and 29, we're told that the house of Israel are those, well, let's just read it. For he is not a Jew, which is one inwardly, neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew, which is one, excuse me, let me reread that. For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. Now, did you see that? That's so powerful. See, when we think of the house of Israel, we often think, oh, that's talking about the Jewish nation. That's talking about the Hebrews. That's talking about God's people. But in the New Testament, Paul says, no, it's not actually. Paul recognized the 70 week, 490 literal year prophecy, that 70 week prophetic day prophecy. He recognized that. And he realized that it had come to an end, that the time determined had ended and the gospel was to go to the Gentiles. And so Paul says, listen, this gospel is going to all the world right now. God has established a new church. The 12 tribes is Old Testament but the 12 apostles is New Testament. This gospel is going to, to the world and it's not about outward circumcision anymore. Being a Jew is not about the literal descendancy from Abraham. Being a Jew is about the inward heart circumcision. Being a Jew is about circumcision of the heart who is walking in the spirit and not in the letter. In fact, he says in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 29 that if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring and you are heirs according to the promise. So the first thing that we've realized here in the context of the New Testament, as we connect it with the Old Testament, which is what we always should be doing, is that the, the house of Israel are all those who belong to Jesus Christ. It's not just literal Jews. It's not just the physical Jews. It's not just the physical, physically circumcised. It's those who are circumcised in the heart. It's spiritual Jews, if you will. It is those who are in Christ, who are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And the promise is the Prince of the Covenant. Covenant. The promise is the new covenant. The promise is salvation in Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world for your sins and for mine. So this is the covenant that I will make with them. Now notice here, it's really important that we recognize God's the one that's making this, this promise. In the context of Hebrews chapter 8, Paul says they made promises and those promises were faulty. God makes promises and those promises are faithful, not faulty. They said everything the Lord has said we will do and be obedient, but they weren't obedient. They didn't do what God asked them to do. So God says, I'm going to do it this time. I'm going to work through my Holy Spirit and I'm going to fill them with the Holy Spirit and I'm going to bring into them a heart to know me. I'm going to fulfill this covenant through my power. So the first part of the new covenant is God's power, not our power, but God's power. Now notice the second part of the new covenant. This is found in Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 10 as we go back. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. So the new covenant is all about God's law. A lot of people today say, oh, God's law has been nailed to the cross. So the Ten Commandments, we don't need to to follow those anymore, really. So stealing and killing and, and committing adultery and coveting, and th that's, we can have false idols and bow down to them. We can take God's name in vain and still call ourselves Christians. No, the Ten Commandments, the moral standard that is a transcript of God's character has never been nailed to the cross. It was the ceremonial laws that were nailed to the cross, fulfilled in Jesus Christ, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. But the moral law stands. That's why Jesus died. He died to, to, to procure forgiveness for our violation, for our transgression of the law. Transgression of the law is sin and sin leads to death. And so he took that consequence upon himself so we could be forgiven, not to continue on in sin, God forbid, but that we could live in newness of life, cleansed from all unrighteousness. And then it goes on to say, I will be their God and they will be my people. So Hebrews chapter 8 verse 10 now is talking about God relationship, a relationship with God. God wants to have a relationship with us. You know, sometimes when we talk about God's law, we get very pharisaical, we get very legalistic. Uh, we start talking about 
the law of God in relationship to a checklist of things we need to do in order to be saved or in order to go to heaven. We're not saved by obedience to God's law. We're not saved by a checklist. That's very pharisaical. God promises to put his law into our hearts and in our minds through relationship with him so that when sin comes, when, when temptation comes to us, we say, no, I can't do that. I can't sin. I, I can't do that to my God because I love him and I have a relationship with him. That's why Jesus says, if you love me, John 14, 15, keep my commandments. The new covenant is based on relationship with God. And then we see in the context of this that we're not going to have every man teaching his neighbor, verse 11, and every man his brother saying, know the Lord for all are going to know me from the least to the greatest. Now, I love this. This is actually speaking about how it is that God is going to fill us with the Holy Spirit. We're not going to, to, to uh, be teaching one another because the Holy Spirit is going to teach us. Now, don't misunderstand this. We have pastors, we have evangelists, we have teachers, but, but this is the point, and it's so important, so vital in the time in which we live. We need to depend on the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. And when a pastor or a teacher or an evangelist comes along, if they're not preaching and teaching from the Word of God, inspired by the Holy Spirit, then they need to go out in one ear and out the other because it's the Holy Spirit that teaches us. A pastor and an evangelist, a teacher today, a Bible worker today should be teaching the Word of God. So there is a place for pastors and teachers as long as they're teaching the Word of God. But today we have the fulfillment of the prophecy in 2 Timothy that, that, Timothy that we have itching ears. People have itching ears and they want to hear pleasant things and they want to hear that God's law is done away with and they want, no, we're not obligated to do any of that anymore and we can just live, you know, according to our feelings and our hearts and what our heart tells us. No, the Word of God is clear. Doctrine, teaching of the Word of God is in harmony with the Holy Spirit and the infilling of the Holy Spirit. In fact, notice what it says here in 1 John chapter 2, verses 20 and 27. And by the way, these verses are in the context of warnings about Antichrist, people who would come and put themselves in the place of Christ and lead us away from the Scriptures. But you... You're not going to listen to the Antichrist because you have an unction. That means an anointing with oil, a smearing with oil. You have an unction from the Holy One and you know all things. Really? We know all things? I've got a lot of questions I still don't know. But the Holy Spirit, the anointing which you have received of Him abides in you and you don't need any man to teach you. Well, who's going to teach me then? The Holy Spirit's going to teach you. But as that same anointing teaches you of all things and His truth and His no lie, even as it has taught you, abide in Him. You shall abide in Him. It goes on here in John chapter 14, verse 26 to tell us that the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, He's going to teach us all things and bring all things to our remembrance, whatever Jesus Christ has said unto us. Another verse, John 16, 13. Howbeit when the Spirit of truth has come, He will guide you into all truth for he shall not speak of himself but whatsoever he shall hear that shall he speak and he will show th you things to come things to come is prophecy things to come is prophecy so we see here that God has included in the new covenant in the holy covenant in the everlasting covenant he's included a promise to anoint us with the Holy Spirit so we don't have to depend upon men so we can be taught by the Holy Spirit led by the Holy Spirit convicted by the Holy Spirit and shown things to come by the Holy Spirit. So the new covenant is God's power, God's law, God relationship, God's spirit. And one other thing, notice what it says here in Hebrews 8, 12, for I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and iniquities I will remember no more. This is God's forgiveness. God's forgiveness is also a vital part of the new covenant. Let's look at this in 1 Timothy 2 verse 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. One more verse, John 1 verse 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So what we're looking at here is a power-packed representation of the new covenant experience that is being attacked, that, that, that there's a rage against in Daniel chapter 11. There is a power that rises up as pagan Rome goes down, another power rises up, and this power puts itself in the place of Christ. That's what anti means, not just against, but in the place of, puts itself in the place of Christ and comes against God's power, God's law, God's uh, God relationship, God's people. God's spirit and the forgiveness that God offers through Jesus Christ as our only mediator. Now, I don't know if you figured out what this power is, but if you look at history, it's quite obvious who this power is. We're talking here not about pagan Rome, but about papal Rome. We're talking about a religious system that compromised with paganism in order to 
gain adherence. In the early centuries, we're talking about third century, fourth century, this power rose up, it departed from the plain teachings of the word of God and the gospel, and it began to compromise with the world, changing a lot of what God had written concerning worship and forgiveness and relationship with God. It said, no, if you want to have a relationship with God, you come through us. If you want forgiveness of God, you come through us. If you want to know what day to worship, you come through us. It actually replaced God with a new system, a new religious system that was seeking to obliterate in a very real sense, according to Bible prophecy, obliterate the everlasting covenant or the holy covenant or the new covenant. So Daniel chapter 11 has this theme of the new covenant. And as we see this theme, the book of Daniel is all about the new covenant. Let's just summarize the book of Daniel. One, one, one quick slide here that we can look at that's going to help us with this. The new covenant theme is in the book of Daniel because first of all, we have God's law. It's talked about in Daniel chapter 3 and Daniel chapter 7. There was an image. They wouldn't bow because second commandment says you don't bow to images. In Daniel chapter seven this little horn power thinks to change times and laws then we have personal relationship Daniel chapter 1 through chapter 12 the whole thing all of these chapters are about Daniel and his friends personal relationship with God then you have the anointing of the spirit over and over again they said of Daniel that he had an excellent spirit an excellent spirit was in him and then you have forgiveness and the blotting out of sins and we see that in Daniel chapter 7 Daniel chapter 8 Daniel chapter 9 and then you have God's power all the way through the book of Daniel you see God's power manifest when he preserves the three Hebrews in the fiery furnace when he preserves Daniel from the lions and on and on it goes. So the whole book of Daniel is really about new covenant experience. So the book of Daniel reveals this attack against God's covenant, this attack against those who have a relationship with God. It's an attack against, for example, God's power. How do we see this attack against God's power? Let's look at Daniel chapter 11 and verse 36. And the king shall do according to his will. He shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every God. And he shall speak marvelous things against the God of gods. So here's the attack openly, flagrant against the God of gods. Daniel chapter 11 and verse 36. What about the attack against God's law? Well, let's look at that in relationship to Daniel chapter 7. Same power, repeat in large, and verse 25. He shall speak great words against the Most High. He shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and he shall think to change times and laws, and they shall be given in his hand for a time, times, and the dividing of time. So there's the attack against God's law. Again, this is an attack against the new covenant. What about the attack against God's people or a relationship with God? Let's look at that in Daniel chapter uh, 11 and verse 35, or 33, excuse me, Daniel 11, verse 33. And they that understand among the people shall instruct many, yet they shall fall by sword and by flame and by captivity and by spoil many days. You know, during the dark ages, we saw a lot of persecution against people who wanted to stay true to God's holy covenant. And those dark ages was filled with persecution and blood. They estimate that 50 to maybe even 100 million people lost their lives during the dark ages under the auspices of the medieval church. So this papal power persecuted, and we know it persecuted because we have historical documents that tell us this. In fact, C.C. Colton, the death penalty for heresy, page 25, says that what compelled the Roman Catholic Church to persecute was the idea that they believed that if you were not Roman Catholic, you were lost and you would burn in hell forever and ever. And so they felt like, well, it'd be better for us to persecute people. They believed themselves actually be doing um, people a favor that by persecuting they could save people from eternally burning. We could torture them. We can do whatever we, 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 we think is necessary to get them to convert and save them from turning in hell forever and ever. Regardless, whatever the motivation was, whatever the reason was, the, uh, the, the, the reason for doing this is wrong. You can't force people to believe in God. You can't persecute people even if you think that your truth, that your uh, doctrine is in harmony with the Bible, which it wasn't. But if you, even if you thought it was, you have to leave people free to choose. God always leaves us free to choose. In fact, we know this persecution was major because when we look at modern statements from the Catholic Church, we find a list of apologies, for example, made by Pope John Paul II. In The Guardian, that was from Wikipedia, and another article in The Guardian, the Pope says he's sorry for the sins 
of the church. Now, I want you to notice something here. It's very significant. He says that John Paul is apologizing for sins committed by the sons of the church, but not for the church itself. The church itself is holy and immaculate. And that's the mindset that we're looking at here in the context of Daniel chapter 11. In other words, you have an organization that admits uh, persecuting thousands and millions of people, even today that admission is made and the confession is made. The Pope is apologizing, for example, in the LA Times, Pope apologizes for Catholic sins of, of the past and the present. And yet at the same time, they're saying the church isn't actually responsible for this. The church is immaculate. The church is holy. It's the sons of the church. It's different individuals that are responsible for this. And so you see there, there's a sleight of hand in a sense. We need to take responsibility for those things that are part of our organized body. And we need to repent and confess if we want to have full forgiveness. We can't be making excuses and we can't be trying to save the image of our church because of the sins that it has committed. So what we see here is an attack against God's people. The Dark Ages brings that out. The verses bring that out. Daniel 11 verses uh, 30 through 36, all talking about the Dark Ages. And then we also have an attack against God's spirit, an attack against God's spirit. Notice what 2 Corinthians 3.17 says. Now the spirit, excuse me, now the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. This is a New Testament verse. This is a New Testament verse that's describing the work of the Holy Spirit. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Now I want you to look at a verse in Daniel chapter 11, verse 38. Daniel 11, verse 38. But in his estate shall he honor the God of forces. A God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and precious stones and pleasant things. See, a transition has taken place here in the context of this prophecy. This power this papal Roman power, this church, professed church, has transitioned from the God of his fathers who believed in letting people be converted by the Holy Spirit, who believed in giving people choice, choose you this day who you will serve, who, who shared the gospel and if the people rejected it, they wiped their feet and they went to the next village like Christ told them to do. To, a peep, to another power now who's forcing people, who's using gold, silver and precious things, who's using economic coercion to force people. The Dark Ages, if you're not part of this church, you can't own property. If you're not part of this church, you can't live in this country. If you're not part of this church, you can't run that, this business. This was the kind of thing that was taking place during the Dark Ages, forcing people. Why were they doing this? Malachi Martin, in the book, Keys of This Blood, He's a Vatican insider and Jesuit, passed to, to rest now. He talks about the struggle for world dominion. And he describes Christians that are faithful to God and to the principles of uh, liberty and freedom. In fact, he even describes Seventh-day Adventists on pages, uh, page 285 of his book, Keys of the Blood. And he talks about these Adventists in the context of John Paul II, of the Pope's philosophy or thinking, the way the Pope thinks. And this is what he says. Among the Christian minimalists, the opposition is virulent and has a long history. That is the opposition to the papacy. Despite the mutual differences, for instance, between the Advent Christian Church and the Church of God Abrahamic faith and the Seventh-day Adventist, that's us, they are one in opposition to Rome as the red whore of the Mediterranean. He goes on. Another important practical trait shared by minimalists is that all of the groups sprang up within Western democracies and the vast majority of them are homegrown products of the United States. They have been formed in the very womb of Western democratic principles about the rights of man and the dignity of the individual. And with few exceptions, they accept the latter day American interpretation of the wall that separates church and state. Now notice what he says in this next, in this next part. In their eyes, their regard and respect for democratic principles impose upon them the obligation, the religious as well as the civil and political obligation to defend every person's right to be wrong. Every person must have the right not only to believe in the hell of the damned and the heaven of the saved, every person must literally be assured the right to choose hell over heaven. And then he says this, that obligation carried to that extreme not only sets minimalists apart from John Paul, it sets them against him as well. 
This is eye-opening. And this is the fulfillment of what we see in Daniel chapter 11. You see, the Catholic Church believes that we can force people, that we can persecute people, that we can make people believe in heaven because if they don't, they're going to go to hell and burn for all eternity, which actually isn't a biblical truth. And so you see this reasoning, this false reasoning that's come into this power, this, this civil and religious power through the dark ages, because it was through the dark ages that our understanding of eternally burning hell came into the church. It was a compromise with Greek philosophy. And that is being used here as a means, as a reason, as a logical reason for persecuting people and making them uh, believe something that they don't truly believe. But the truth of the matter is, no matter how much you persecute someone, no matter how much pressure you put upon them, economic or otherwise, you can't force them to believe in God. In their hearts, they're not going to believe. Even if they acquiesce outwardly, they're still not going to believe and still not going to be saved. So this is a principle of Satan's kingdom. It's not a principle of God's kingdom. It's a principle of the kingdom of the dragon who's wroth with the woman and makes war with her in Revelation 12, 17 and gives its seat to this power. But it's not a principle of the kingdom of God because his kingdom is based on love and motivating people by love to accept Jesus Christ. Christ. So Time Magazine, June 17, 1991, said John Paul II denounced the separation of church and state. This was the power of papal Rome from its rise in the early 6th century to power, at least civil power, as well as religious power, all the way till 1798. This was the system that was in place. It was a, a combination of civil and religious power that ruled the world, the Dark Ages, and forced people to accept religion on the pain of torture and death, on the pain of economic loss. And it's all outlined here in the verses that we've read. So here's a summary of the New Covenant. It's with the house of Israel, those who belong to Christ. It's talking about God's power. It's talking about God's law, God's people, uh, relationship with God, God's spirit. God's forgiveness, and it's outlining an, an attack against God's power, against God's law, against God's people, against that relationship with God, against God's spirit, and against God's sanctuary. Let's look at that last one, God's sanctuary. In Daniel chapter 11, verse 31, an arm shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that makes desolate. Now, this is really easy to understand. It's talking about the heavenly sanctuary being polluted. It's talking about taking away that sanctuary truth where Jesus Christ, as we read earlier, is our only mediator. How do they do that? Well, let me give you a more uh, recent quote from Los Angeles Times. This is December of 1984. Rebutting a, a belief widely shared by Protestants and a growing number of Roman Catholics... Pope John Paul II on Thursday dismissed the widespread idea that one can obtain forgiveness directly from God and exhorted Catholics to confess more often to their priests. This is how it's being done. And it's very practical. And I'm just going to give you an illustration for my own life. I was raised Roman Catholic. I was raised going to Catholic schools. I was an altar boy. I was raised going to a priest and confessing my sins. And it never changed my heart or my life. I would sin, go to church, confess my sins, and go back to sinning, go to church, confess my sins, go back to sinning, go to church, confess my sins. Because there is no power in the mediation of a man. There is no power. The power for cleansing and forgiveness is found in the mediation of Jesus Christ only. That's what 1 Timothy is trying to tell us there's only one mediator that can actually forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, 1 Timothy 2, 5, and that's Jesus Christ. He's the only one that can forgive and cleanse, John chapter 1, or 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. So I would do this and I would live that same life. It wasn't until I became a Christian and a Seventh-day Adventist Christian after that that I experienced the true and powerful cleansing that Jesus Christ offers us. And when was that? What date was that that I became a Seventh-day Adventist? Well, first I became a Christian. I was going to Calvary Chapel and I was going to a Pentecostal church. And as I kept studying the Bible, I was trying to get my sister out of the, uh, the, out of the Adventist church, actually, because so I thought it was some kind of cult. And I found myself, the Bible leading me right into the Seventh-day Adventist church. It was the year 1984, the very same year that this statement was made by Pope John Paul II. And I remember in 1984, I was baptized 
And I, moved, I went, went to England, because I was raised in England. I went to England. My mom was there and, and uh, other family members, my grandma and, and other friends. And I went to England to share with them this beautiful truth that I had discovered so practical in my life that my sins had been forgiven, the guilt had been taken away, and I was a free man in Jesus Christ. And I loved the Lord and was keeping his commandments because of that. And I remember my mom called the priest. Uh, priest Matthew came over to the house. I was out in the garden. And he came over to the house and, and he came around the corner and he said, I hear you got a new religion. And he started talking to me about my new religion. He said, how are you going to get forgiveness if you don't come to church, if you don't come to mass, if you don't come to confess it? How are you going to get forgiveness? Because the Catholic church is the only place that you can get forgiveness. We are the only ones that can give you forgiveness. And I said, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. Now, I was a newbie. I didn't know the Bible that well, but the Holy Spirit gave me that verse. The Holy Spirit does that for those who have relationship with God, gives you the right words at the right time. And the Holy Spirit gave me that that verse, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, there's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And I shared that with, with uh, priest Matthew. I told him that. Now, this, is, this, is, this has been the priest that I've been familiar with since I was just, you know, a little boy, five, six years old, going to, you know, communion, going to uh, mass, being an altar boy. And I shared that with him. I was intimidated. I was overwhelmed, but I shared that with him. And the word of God was powerful. And it put uh, a, a, a boundary between me and him. And it was like, that was where my strength and power was. It wasn't in me. It was in the Word of God. That's where your strength and power comes from, friends. It comes from your relationship with God. It comes from your dependence on the Word of God. It comes from this new covenant experience and relationship. So the new covenant is with the house of Israel, is with all those that belong to Christ. It, it involves God's power. It involves God's law. It involves God's people, relationship with God. It involves God's spirit and God's forgiveness. And it's being attacked in Daniel chapter 11. Daniel chapter 11 is basically summarizing the attack against God's covenant. Daniel chapter 11, verse 22, the prince of the covenant is broken. Daniel chapter 11, verse 28, he's moved against the covenant. Daniel chapter 11 and verse 30, he has rage against the covenant. Daniel chapter 11 and verse 30, he regards those who forsake the holy covenant. Daniel chapter 11 and verse 32, he, he corrupts against the holy covenant. He corrupts those against the holy covenant. So there we have it. That's the summary of what's taking place in Daniel chapter 11, verses 28 and onward. We see God's power, God's law, God's people, God's spirit, God's forgiveness being attacked. Really what's being attacked is the holy covenant or the new covenant experience that God wants to have with each one of us. So, so far what we've learned in this biblical principle of repeat and enlarge is that Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 9 or 8 and Daniel 11 are all parallel prophecies. They all begin back in da Daniel's time with Babylon, Medo-Persia, and they all moved down from Babylon to Medo-Persia to Greece to pagan Rome and to papal Rome. Each one of those parallel prophecies repeats and enlarges. It gives us more insight and more understanding. And this is the key. This is the key to unlocking the rest of Daniel chapter 11. If we want to understand Daniel 11 verses 28 all the way to 45, we need to understand this prophetic principle of repeat and enlarge, this biblical prophetic principle of repeat and enlarge. So, how are we going to understand the rest of these verses? How are we going to understand verses 36 all the way to 45? You know, sometimes I, I say to myself, if we only had a Daniel chapter 13 to help us figure out the last part of Daniel chapter 11. Oh, that would be such a blessing. So we want to search the Bible and see if God has given us a Daniel chapter 13. Now we know we don't have a Daniel chapter 13 in the Old Testament. Daniel ends with chapter 12, which is kind of like a summary, if you will. But perhaps there's a Daniel chapter 13 somewhere in the New Testament. Join us next time as we continue our search.